Hello, my name is Peter Whitehead, and this is one of a series of talks uh, on art, uh, which I prepared for the Bromley branch of U3A Art Appreciation Group during lockdown. Um, I'll just make the point that the Art Appreciation Group is a group of people who are very interested in art, but we are not experts and I am not an expert. So please uh, take what I say in this, uh, uh, bear that in mind. Uh, the images that you'll see in this presentation have all been found uh, on the internet, mainly in the wiki art uh, site. So today, going to talk about Caspar David Friedrich uh, and his link with German Romanticism. Friedrich's dates are 1774 to 1840, so he's a contemporary of Turner and Constable, born the year before Turner and two years before Constable. Uh, some books refer to him as the painter of stillness. Landscape is central to his work, but not necessarily just an imitation uh, of what we see, but a combination of the visual representation and the emotional response to the landscape. Um, sometimes his landscapes are called moodscapes, and quite often there's quite a lot of allegorical elements to it. And all this derives really uh, from the Romantic uh, movement to Romanticism. So I think it would be helpful if we had a look at what that meant, first of all. Well, in the 18th century, it was really seen as the, the age of reason. Uh, Newton had discovered certain laws, uh, and these laws governed the universe, and it was also felt that if laws governed the physical world, they should govern society as well. And this really is a very static model. Um, there's not really much scope in here for change or even evolution. The idea of knowledge is that knowledge was something that you remembered. You read or were told something and then you remembered it and that was how knowledge uh, was assimilated and it really prioritized reality and knowledge over imagination art mimetic means that it imitates what it sees the purpose of art is to give pleasure therefore you should focus on beauty and all this takes its inspiration from the classical world and from greece and rome in particular as i say uh, it's a rules based system. Now, from the 1760s, this model starts to be challenged as incomplete, not necessarily wrong. But Romanticism starts coming to the fore. Now, the first thing you've got to do is forget Mills and Boone. This is not that kind of rom romantic. Uh, it takes its name for the Romance languages as opposed to Greek and Latin. And it applies to many areas, so it's not just a movement that applies in the world of art. It's about philosophy, music and literature as well. And Romanticism really looks at imagination and emotion, which it says the previous model completely fails to get to grips with. And the key point in Romanticism is that there is no external reality which we all experience. Reality is something that we experience individually uh, and it is accessed via the imagination. It's a fundamentally different way of looking at the world and therefore art, rather than being uh, mimetic, should use the imagination. And it also says that just looking at the classical world uh, is too limiting. You ought to take inspiration from other cultures. So uh, Orientalism, if you think of the Brighton Pavilion, that's the prime example of that in this country, perhaps. But also that you should remember your own culture, your own uh, national uh, tales. The Brothers Grimm in Germany are very influential at this time. 
um, putting together what we tend to think of as fairy tales, but if you read, read the original tales, they are much, much darker than that. And this is really our way of looking at the world. There's not been a major change in the way we look at the world since this. Um, and I think it was Bertrand Russell said, we are the heirs of romanticism. So the way that we perceive the world is largely through romantic eyes. And for example, if we think uh, that painters should be people who suffer, who lives in living uh, garrets, uh, who suffer for their art, well, that's a very romantic view. The uh, painters of the 18th century wouldn't have had any time for that at all. So in this slide, I've just tried to uh, con compare and contrast uh, to summarize what I've just said. Um, so on the left, you have the idea that you have a rational universe. Everything is uniform. Uh, it, takes its uh, inspiration from the classical world. On the right, the, the new romantic way of looking at the world. Um, uh, art is imagination. And actually, the artist is the person who gives us access to this aesthetic experience, which in some way is spiritual. It's a quasi religious way of looking at art. Uh, and modern, well, relatively speaking, um, modern in the sense of not looking back to the classical world. It did quite often look back to the medieval world. The two are not in conflict. There's just that the romantics argued that there is more to life than the enlightenment concept of the world. And they focused on various elements. Nature. Uh, was something that the Romantics felt should be um, celebrated. Uh, they produced the idea of the sublime, and the sublime in this sense uh, is contrasted with the picturesque. So something that is beautiful is picturesque, and you know, uh, the Enlightenment thought that is what art should concentrate on. The romantic said, well, there is more to nature than just being beautiful. There is the power of nature. There is the power that man cannot control, the storm, the avalanche, things like that. And all that was referred to as the sublime. Symbols become very important. The use of um, symbols in paintings, and we'll see that when we look at some paintings by Friedrich. They also thought that childhood was very important. The child was a natural human. It was a human in its original state before it was educated. So the feelings of childhood were natural feelings. But they also saw that the irrational, so the mystical and the supernatural, were things that could be celebrated. The importance of dreams starts to be uh, investigated here. And this actually leads later on um, you know, a century later, the work of Freud uh, and psychoanalysts really develops from these romantic concepts. Um, because the romantics don't believe in rules, they celebrate artists who break the rules. And it's at this time that Shakespeare became, becomes seen as one of the major playwrights, uh, not just in this country, but uh, in Europe as well. Why? because Shakespeare does break the rules, it breaks the classical rules, which say that if you write a comedy, everything has to be funny. If you write a tragedy, everything has to be tragic. Um, Shakespeare writes tragic comedies. He puts comedy elements in tragedies. Um, that would not have been appreciated by the classical Greek uh, dramatists, uh, but it was by the Romantics. So scenes of Shakespeare become very important in the Romantic movement. And basically, you, you see the artist, as I said, as this Byronic hero struggling against fate by the power of their will. That is the essence of being an artist in the uh, Romantic uh, concept. Romanticism, though, wasn't necessarily uh, consistent across Europe. There were different elements, uh, depending on which country you in. And that German Romanticism, who, which is very important to um, 
Caspar Darvish Friedrich, um, really starts life as a philosophical movement, um, a, a change in the way in which the world is seen. And that finds its way into the Sturm und Drang movements, the 1760 to 1780, uh, the writings of Goethe, um, which are certainly classical in form, but they add emotion and the unconscious, which has not been uh, reflected before. Of course, when I talk about Germany here, there is no such thing as Germany. Um, in northern Germany, the, uh, the key power is probably France. It's influenced by France. Uh, French would be the language spoken in the courts of northern Germany. In southern Germany, um, the influence is Italy. And there's also a split there between the Protestant North and the Catholic South. German nationalism starts to develop as this, this time as a reaction against the uh, outside influences. Um, Napoleon in the early 1800s invades most of Germany. Um, there's a reaction against that. Uh, and people start asking the question, what is Germany and what does German mean? And to do that, they look back to the Middle Ages, to the Gothic period, because what we now think of as Germany had never been part of the classical world. The uh, Roman legions had never really ventured across the Rhine. Um, and when they had ventured across the Rhine, they normally ended up with a bloody nose. Um, so unlike Britain, uh, Germany had never been part of this Roman Empire. Um, and they didn't see why they should therefore be constrained by the classical rules of a, of a society and a culture which they had never belonged to. It's a slightly different approach in different countries, as I said, just as a, a illustration here. Uh, for France, Romanticism meant man as the centre of the universe, the master of nature. It focused on people, the influence of of people and the emotions that people were experiencing. If you think of the works of Delacroix and Jericho, they all focus on things like that. The um, raft of the uh, Medusa, for instance, by Jericho is all about the terrified emotions of the people um, set adrift on that raft. In Britain, Turner's probably the best example of a romantic uh, painter um, and Turner's focus is on the forces of nature and man in conflict with that so the, the storms at sea and things like that also um, the influence of new technology uh, uh, on uh, man is something that Turner brings into this concept in Germany on the other hand it's all about alienation Man is anxious, is lonely, alienated from the present day society and from the tradition of the past and seeking solace in nature, really. So that's a very brief and uh, amateur <laughs> analysis of what Romanticism was about. And as we can see how this is reflected in the works of the principal um, romantic painter uh, uh, in Germany, Caspar David Friedrich. Um, this portrait in 1806, I think, gives you an idea of what was expected of the romantic artist. He looks vaguely deranged. He certainly looks angry. It's not the kind of relaxed uh, portrait that you might expect or the self-portrait of an artist at work or the portrait of an artist working at his easel. This is uh, a much more um, romanticised portrait of an artist. Friedrich was born in a place called Greifswald in North Germany. I've got a map later on to show you where that is. But at the time, that was in Sweden. He studied in Copenhagen and moved to Dresden in 1798. Uh, he was the son of a soap maker, brought up a strict Lutheran. His mother died in 1781 when he was seven. And in 1787, uh, Friedrich fell through the ice uh, of a, a pond, I think, 
uh, and had to be rescued by one of his brothers and his brother died in rescuing Friedrich. So bear all that in mind because I think we're going to see elements of that uh, in the paintings that we look at in a minute. Uh, here's a map of the various areas. Griesfeld you see in the middle there on the Baltic. Uh, it was once an important port uh, but it passed to Sweden after the Thirty Years War. Uh, it returned to Prussia in 1815 uh, in, uh, in the settlement, uh, the post-Napoleonic settlement of Europe. Uh, Copenhagen at the top is where Friedrich studied. Rügen, we'll see some paintings of Rügen uh, later on, um, on the Baltic. Uh, Dresden, towards the bottom, where he made his home uh, from uh, 1798 at the age of 24. Uh, and the Riesengebirge, again, these are a range of mountains now in Poland, I think, but outside at Dresden, um, a subject matter that he used quite often. Friedrich is a very North German painter. Um, he never really traveled outside the area um, marked on that map. He never went to Italy uh, or uh, ranged further uh, afield. We can say some things about Friedrich's style. As I said before, he very much concentrates on landscape, but not on the uh, mimetic, but combining the visual impression with the emotions that that uh, landscape creates. He very often uh, uses a geometric construction the paintings are very often quite symmetrical and you have strong contrast to vertical and horizontal planes. Um, this was something that later appealed very much to the Cubists, the Futurists, the Vorticists, all of whom actually looked back at uh, Friedrich uh, and took inspiration for him. He also uses something called the Rücken figure, um, a German uh, phrase that just means someone seen from behind. Uh, you very rarely see the face of a human figure in a Friedrich painting. Sometimes the figures are very insignificant, um, but it, this always introduces a feeling of uh, ambivalence because we can't see the human figure. How do we know what their emotions are? It's very difficult to tell that from behind. You have to see someone's face to tell that. So this is something that uh, Friedrich exploits. Uh, he said at one stage, the artist should paint not only what he sees before him, but also what he sees within him. It's a very romantic um, uh, approach. So let's look at some examples of Friedrich's work. This is, we're going to go through them more or less uh, chronologically. So in 1807, at the age of 33, he creates works like this. There's a landscape, a seascape. Um, again, I draw your attention to the horizontal divisions in the painting. So in the foreground, you have the shore, you have the sea, and then three quarters, two thirds of the painting taken up by sky, but all enveloped in this mist. Um, and you have the vertical elements in it are the masts of the ships, um, which provide a link between the sea and the sky. Uh, what's the symbolism here? Uh, well, mist is always related to uncertainty. Um, we don't know what's happening on these ships. We can see one ship is being rowed, one ship has got a sail up, but beyond that, this is just uh, a more or less blank landscape and it is reflecting the the kind of uh, the the uncertainty and uh, that mist produces in the same year uh, he produces this a dolmen is the um, stone uh, construction in the centre of the painting there. The dolmen is a prehistoric grave. Uh, it's surrounded by oak trees. 
Um, now the oak tree was taken as a representation of Germany because there were so many forests in Germany, the oak tree stood for Germany. And the prehistoric grave there, again, is looking back to the pre-classical period and what Germany was at that time. Um, but there's more symbolism at work here. The oak trees themselves look rather unhealthy. The one in the center is bent by the wind. Um, the branches are bare, it's under snow. Um, you also have the horizontal and vertical divide of the painting. So you've got the foreground, midground, background, which is the sky. You've got the verticals of the trees. This was painted in 1807. In 1806, Napoleon had invaded and occupied Dresden. So is this Germany under Napoleon's rule? Um, and there's also a kind of quasi-religious element to this. Um, the three trees, could they possibly represent the three crosses at Golgotha, the crucifixion of Christ, and the stone, stone chamber there, the stone tomb? Is that the tomb where Christ was entombed? We don't know. Um, the interesting things about Friedrich's paintings is you interpret them in your own way. Friedrich did produce uh, religious paintings. This was com a commission for a chapel in Tetchen uh, in Bohemia. Uh, and it puts Christ in a Germanic setting. Uh, for the first time, really, um, you've got landscape uh, adapted for use uh, in a symbolic way. Uh, and I've got a quote from this, which I'm going to read you, uh, which describes this painting. High up on the mountain stands the cross, surrounded by evergreen fir trees and evergreen ivy twines around the base of the cross. The glowing sun is sinking and the savior on the cross shines in the crimson sunset. The cross stands on a rock as unshakably firm as our faith in Jesus Christ. Fir trees rise around the cross, evergreen and everlasting, like the hope of men in him, the crucified Christ. It's, as I say, designed to be an altarpiece. It wasn't accepted as such. It was too radical. Altarpieces at that time should be um, an accepted view of the crucifixion as painted by Renaissance artists uh, in Italy. Um, moving it to a Germanic context didn't really uh, work at the time. There are a couple of other romantic traits in this particular painting. Um, perspective doesn't come into a great in, into play a great deal, but what does uh, strike you is the subtle use of colour and light. And that again is a very romantic uh, approach. The lack of perspective is something you see in the next painting, The Monk by the Sea. Uh, a monk, a medieval figure, is very, you can see him just there in the, uh, in the foreground, uh, the centre left. Um, the sea is behind him. Um, the monk is the only vertical in the picture, everything else is horizontal. There's a very low horizon, about five sixths of the painting is sky. Uh, so you have a solitary figure contemplating the vastness of nature and the presence of God. And it's an almost abstract element to this painting. Uh, and, and that has an influence later as well. And this was always hung uh, together with the next painting where we see monks again, we have verticals and horizontals here. Um, there's a funeral uh, procession taking place in the foreground past an open grave. Uh, there's a ruined abbey. Ruins were very uh, important to uh, the Romantics. Um, and there's a kind of negative beauty about this is deliberate 
um, monotony of the painting, there's repetition, emptiness, and distance from nature, all that is um, reflected in this painting. And in fact, it's got an element of the Gothic horror, the kind of Hammer Films uh, side to it, you know, that a ruined graveyard with bare trees behind. You can almost imagine that the vampire might emerge from one of those graves. And that would be entirely in, in keeping with the romantic tradition. Ram vampires were first written about at about this time of 1810, um, you know, uh, 90 years before Dracula was written about. This uh, painting, again, 1810, is very similar to the Tetchan altarpiece. Uh, a blonde woman uh, leads a man to the cross. Faith leads to salvation. You can see the man climbing up the rocks with the aid of the woman, the woman leading the way. Uh, the recent Geberga I mentioned earlier, this is the range of mountains outside Dresden. Um, and the cross is the link between heaven and earth. So again, look at the vertical division of the painting. Um, the cross is what links heaven, the sky, to earth. That's the symbolism of this particular uh, painting. If you want to see a Friedrich painting in the flesh, as it were, I think this is the only one you can see in this country. Um, most of his paintings are in Germany in the uh, uh, Alta National Gallery in Berlin is a good place to go to see them, you know, assuming we're ever allowed to travel again. <clears throat> but this is in the National Gallery. Quite a small painting, actually. Um, but it's an appeal to politics and religion based on a medieval past. Um, I referred to symmetry uh, in, in, in his paintings. You can see the symmetry in the Gothic cathedral in the background and the, the towers of the cathedral uh, mirror the fir trees in the foreground. Nature and religion are one in this painting. So in the fir trees, emblematic of Germany, you see a crucifix. And then at the foot of the crucifix, <clears throat> leaning against the stone, there is uh, a man praying. And if you see on his way to uh, that rock, he has discarded two crutches. So has there been a miracle? And what is he praying to? Is he praying to Christ on the cross or is he praying to nature as represented by the fir trees? Um, you can interpret it uh, however uh, you like, but uh, that's, uh, that, that's my take on it. This is perhaps the most overtly nationalist uh, of all uh, Friedrich's paintings. 1813, uh, Napoleon has embarked upon his uh, ruinous invasion of Russia. <clears throat> he's been defeated before Moscow and he's, he's on the retreat, which is going to take him all the way back to Paris. Uh, so in 1813, he's probably retreating through Germany. And we see here a chasseur who is a French cavalryman um, on his own before this dark, dismal wood. His, his way lies through the wood, but it doesn't look uh, as if this is going to be a very encouraging journey. Uh, and the symbolism of this is he's a chasseur, he's a cavalryman, but he's on his own. He's been... Um, separated from all his colleagues and he doesn't have his horse with him. He's a dismounted chasseur uh, and perched on the tree stump in the foreground is a raven. Um, and the ravens in Norse mythology are the messengers of uh, Odin, uh, particularly messengers of death. So I think we can see uh, that this is not going to end well. This chasseur is going into the depths of this wood uh, from which there is no escape uh, and which for him represents death. <clears throat> the 1815 Congress of uh, Vienna after the settlement uh, of the Napoleonic, after the Napoleonic Wars was a great um, disappointment to uh, Friedrich uh, and many other um, 
romantics. They thought that the removal of Napoleon would lead to um, a freeing up of restrictions, where in fact the uh, restrictions, the censorship imposed after 1815 was, if anything, um, stronger than that imposed by Napoleon. And Friedrich at this point retreats back to northern uh, Germany and in 1818 at the age of 44 uh, he marries a young woman of 25. And that's reflected in this painting, the chalk cliffs at Rugen. Rugen on the map that I showed you previously uh, on the Baltic. And we have after um, Friedrich's marriage, you start to see women appear in the paintings more often. Uh, in this uh, painting here, the woman on the left in red uh, represents love. Red is the colour of love. The man in the centre is in blue. Blue is the colour of faith. And the man on the right in green Green is the colour of hope. So Rugen is where Friedrich spent his honeymoon. And if you look, the uh, cliffs and the trees do seem to make a kind of heart shape. Uh, we've got near and far represented here. The ships are sailing out onto the sea of life. So this is the change in Friedrich's life. He's married. Uh, and life is, is uh, taking a new uh, turn. This is Friedrich and one of his pupils. Uh, so the subject of the painting is friendship and love. There's a dead oak tree there. Again, is that Germany? Germany failed to free itself from the Napoleonic um, invasion. Um, they're wearing old German costume, not contemporary clothes. Uh, and this was the costume adopted by military, militant students who were uh, agitating for change. Um, so uh, it is much more than two men looking at the moon. And Friedrich's most famous painting is probably this, The Wanderer Above a Sea of Mist. Here's the Rukan figure uh, in its um, most obvious form. Uh, the man here has climbed up uh, and is looking over the mountains. He's out of the mist. He's looking into the distance. But we have no idea what he's thinking. Is he just admiring the view? Is he in awe of what he can see? We really don't know. I have to say this is one of the most famous paintings of Romanticism and if like me you're a great collector of classical music and you will find this painting on literally dozens of CD covers or LP covers. Any kind of romantic um, music, be it Schubert, Beethoven, uh, Mendelssohn, this is all illustrated by this particular painting. Uh, because it it is the epitome of romanticism, the Byronic hero uh, who has struggled up to the top uh, of this uh, mountain, we assume, and takes a view of the distance, a view of the future, who knows. Uh, and this is all about as well a reunion with the spiritual self through the contemplation of nature. This is what the romantics believed in. If you reflected on the power of nature, you would gain some sort of spiritual insight. The next two paintings are a pair. They're uh, identical size, both painted in 1822. Uh, if you look at this painting, at first glance, it's about a tree, but um, have a look at the bottom of the tree. There's someone, a shepherd, presumably sheltering there with his sheep. It's difficult to work out the scale of the painting. If you look beyond the tree, there is clearly a village in the distance. You can see a church spire and the mountains beyond it. But again, this is that tree links heaven to earth 
uh, and the top of it is certainly dying. Um, so is this about the lack, the loss of faith, uh, which is being experienced? Um, and it's also a bit dreamlike in that the scale of it is quite unclear. Um, uh, that is a very big tree uh, when you compare it with the chap standing at the bottom. And this was linked with this painting, the seascape. Again, the horizontal and the vertical elements, um, which direction of the ship sailing in, you have to look closely uh, to work that. Is this a farewell? Is the, are they welcoming them back? You can't tell because you can't see their faces. Um, so that's all the ambiguity you get from Friedrich's paintings. This is uh, Friedrich's wife looking out of the window in Dresden. Caroline Burma is his wife. She's looking out on the Elbe. And again, you've got the near and far elements of this. You've got the interior looking through the window outside to the ship's mast on the Elbe and the trees in the distance. Um, You've got very geometrical elements, the straight lines, uh, vertical and horizontal. Uh, you can't tell what she's thinking. Is she saying farewell to someone? Is she welcoming someone? Is she just shaking a duster out of the window? You really can't tell. Um, and some people put a religious interpretation on this. The window at the top has a cross in it. Uh, is she looking across the river, across the river in Jordan, to the beyond, to death? Well, we don't really know. Uh, Friedrich leaves it up to us to interpret that, and that is a very romantic view as well. Um, someone, when I was researching uh, this topic, uh, I was listening to some lectures on Friedrich, and someone said, you know, it hadn't struck me before, but this is a Vermeer turn through 90 degrees. Um, in other words, if you think of all the uh, Vermeers that you see, like this one, there's a window there, but Vermeer positions himself um, at 90 degrees, so the light falls on the subject, whereas uh, Friedrich is behind and, and uh, the light uh, has no impact whatsoever. You're just really seeing a bit of a silhouette. But um, I thought it was an interesting comparison. I don't think Friedrich would ever have been aware of, of Vermeer's paintings. They weren't known in the early 19th century and he'd certainly never traveled to the low countries where he might have expected to see any, but it's an interesting comparison. This painting is also known as the Wreck of Hope. Uh, the a ship has been crushed in the ice. Our fascination with the polar regions was very much part of the Romantic movement. If you've ever read the book Frankenstein rather than seen the, uh, the film, a lot of that takes place in the Arctic. Uh, and so the Romantics, the power of uh, the frozen north and the power of the ice to crush ships was something that was, they really responded to. And also think back to what I told you about <clears throat> uh, Friedrich's experiences as a child, where he'd fallen through the ice and his brother had been killed rescuing him. You possibly get a feeling for, of that in, in this as well. Um, it could also be a political metaphor of the icy grip of political repression under the politicians such as Metternich uh, at, that, at that time in uh, Europe. Um, at the time, this painting was greeted with total incomprehension. People couldn't understand it. Um, it was never sold. No one wanted uh, to possess a painting like this, but it did have an impact later on. 120 years later, Paul Nash produces this painting in the Second World War. Paul Nash is a surrealist painting, a painter. In 1940, he's a war uh, artist and um, he painted Totesmeer, means Dead Sea. It's actually a, 
a rubbish tip, I suppose, of crashed aircraft. All the parts have been assembled there, but the pallet is really quite the same as uh, Friedrich's. And Nash, I think, acknowledged he'd been very influenced by Friedrich's painting the Sea of Ice uh, when he uh, came uh, to paint Totus Mir. Uh, so in many senses, Friedrich is before his time. 1826, Friedrich starts to feel unwell. Um, he goes to Rügen to recuperate. I suspect that he's suffering with what we would now term depression, um, but um, something that wasn't well known about at the time. He becomes aware of death and mortality. So you start to get this uh, into his paintings. Here's a graveyard under snow with the bare trees in the background and there's a grave has been dug in the foreground just waiting for someone to fill it quite a depressing uh, picture uh, if, if you like uh, and by 1835 uh, in this year he has uh, a stroke and really uh, paints no more after that um, so this is one of his last paintings, The Stages of Life. You, there are five figures, the elderly man with the stick, uh, a younger couple and two children. And the five people are mirrored by the five ships on the Sea of Life, all at various stages in their journey. Um, again, it's a reflection on the transitory nation of life uh, and on mortality. And the last painting I want to show you here, Wrecking the Moonlight, uh, very atmospheric, very dark in all senses of the word, uh, painting uh, the wreck <coughs> of Friedrich's hopes, possibly. So I'll just end the talk by considering Friedrich's legacy. Uh, I said he was unwell from about 1825. He starts to focus on mortality. He has a stroke in 1835 and he died five years later. His works were collected, um, particularly uh, by um, the uh, Prus uh, Prussian royal family. Uh, they were also, um, surprisingly, um, collected by the Russian royal family. So uh, that's where you'll find a lot of Friedrichs uh, now in Russia or, or in Berlin. The first critical assessment of uh, Friedrich's role comes 50 years after his death, really. He's, he's more or less forgotten after his death. Um, painting moves on. Um, but in 1893, uh, this uh, exhibition is put together where it says, well, actually, what Friedrich has done and what I hope I've illustrated, we're looking at the selection of his paintings, that he had established landscape painting as a significant genre in its own right. It's not just the background to a portrait or something like that. Landscape can actually have a meaning. It can, there's a message in a landscape rather than, oh, just look at this beautiful tree or this beautiful lake or something like that. And let's say 1906, 32 of Friedrich's paintings were all together in an exhibition. It had an influence on painters of the time, the Expressionists and the Surrealists, which I've touched on uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the talk. But disaster overtakes um, Friedrich, really. He was liked by the Nazis. The Nazis knew what they didn't like, the degenerate art, and very much focused on suppressing that. But they also knew what they liked, and they liked uh, Friedrich's view of Germany and the German past. They liked his um, concentration on the medieval, on the forests, on the prehistoric uh, Germany, and you have to say on uh, a kind of a, a Aryan uh, Germany. The, this nationalist element of the glorious past, um, it, it appeals both to um, 
the Prussia of uh, Kaiser Bill uh, and to the Nazis. Uh, so he falls out of favour again, really, uh, after the Second World War. And it's not until the 1970s that uh, people start looking at him again in a new light and rediscovering uh, his, his impact as a significant landscape painter and his influence with his geometrical forms, the rook and figure, things like that, on um, symbolist paintings such as say, painters such as Munch, the surrealists, and the expressionists who looked at the world from a subjective uh, perspective, uh, who very much took the romantic view that reality is internal, not external. So that's the end of this presentation. Uh, I hope you've in, in, enjoyed it. Just a, a quick uh, run through Caspar uh, David Friedrich and his influence. Someone I think is well worth uh, investigating further. Uh, thank you for listening.